service, I was talking to a guy and said, how's your Christmas going? He said, no, no Christmas holidays for me. I said, why? He said, we are doing all the servicing and all the fire equipment um, and had all his holidays canceled. So Boxing Day, New Year's Day, everybody was there on the tools. And I just thought, I'll bet the team of people that are fighting fires is massive. And a lot of them would be tired. So I just thought, in your prayers, just pray for those people that are just you know, showing up, doing all sorts of things, providing food, water, vehicles, maintenance, you know, as well as the guys actually on the line fighting the fires. So please pray for them. Second thing is, um, coming up February, we're restarting the ministry training school. So um, those uh, block of students that went through the whole year, they are finished the official part of it, but many of them are going to continue on into the first term because we're doing something in addition to that is the first term of the ministries training school now is going to be all about sort of the inside ways on helping people become ministers in the church. So we're going to teach people every practical kind of thing on how we work together as Hope Central ministry team, blessing, encouraging, and equipping people. And if you want uh, training or inside understanding of any of that, just you need to come to ministry training school. It's going to be awesome. Even if you're involved in the ministry right now and you're just like, I just need to know the details on how this all goes together. We would love to have you there. And then in the second term, uh, we are going to go right into all of the Bible tra training, teaching, um, uh, doctrine, and important uh, information about Christianity that you really is basic, basic to understanding, but so profound. So um, if you're thinking at all about getting deeper in the word, getting deeper in your understanding of how to be a minister for Christ, then we would love to have you at ministry training school. So be praying and thinking about that. And when you finally say yes, then it starts in February, right? A little hint there, a little psychological pressure. That's what I'm here for, a little bit of guilt and shame. Um, today we are uh, launching a new year, and as I uh, typically do, I feel like J the first Sunday in January is the time I need to launch a word from the Lord for the whole church uh, that we're going to be considering all year long. And before I get into what that is, I kind of feel like it's an odd time to do that because it's kind of the middle of the year in many ways, and there's a lot of people that aren't here. So I kind of feel like, what am I supposed to do? Just say it in February when everybody comes back from the holidays and everybody's got skin cancer and we're all <laughs> like, like when, when does, and so I just feel, always feel like I'm supposed to say it prophetically, like I'm supposed to speak it, and then we're going to be developing it out over the whole year. And, and we're going to talk about it from this start. We are going to be talking about um, this moment in the life of Jesus. Now, if, in case you were wondering, a couple of weeks ago, we just celebrated Christmas, and that was when Jesus was how old? Zero. Very good. Um, <clears throat> then we know very little about his life up to maybe age two, probably be the maximum age where he might have gone to Egypt in. And then we don't hear anything about him until he's 12, and then we hear a little story about his travels to the temple in Jerusalem. And then we fast forward into Jesus' adult life. We, we don't, this is the kind of the moment when we pick up the story of Jesus again. And he's 30-ish years old. He's a carpenter. He's probably running his father's uh, business. Joseph has probably passed away by this time or killed by nefarious Roman soldiers. We don't know. And so he's, he's, he's G God takes him out of his sort of normal life and launches him into all of his prophetic uh, appearance that he was supposed to have. Here is Jesus, and he's suddenly hitting the stage. Now, when he hits the stage, there's a, there's two things that happens. His baptism, and then immediately goes into the desert. So he, he gets baptized, and then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. The Jordan River connects the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea, and up very near the top of that, very close to the Sea of Galilee, is where John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan. So He's led by, after he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ending, he was hungry. Now, sometimes you have to be a little bit obvious, right? The whole point of the whole 40-day thing is we're hungry, okay? So hungry for what? Food of some sort, right? The devil picks up on the easy logic of that says to him, if you are the son of God, command the stones to become bread. And Jesus says, uh, how about I make you into bread? Now, I just, I always wish, maybe you've heard me make this joke before, I always wish that Jesus had done that, turned the devil into bread, turned him back into the devil, and just said, just kidding, you know. If you're starting to make suggestions of who we're turning into bread, it's going to be you first. And, and so, the, so he doesn't. Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now, just a quick test. Does anybody know what the next line is? 
No. It's actually not. You are talking about the Gospel of Matthew version of the story. <laughs> ah, little trick. Ha ha. Ha ha. In, in, this, in this version, this telling of the story, thanks, Sam, you found the rings, um, that in this version, it doesn't say um, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, that's true, and that's right, and the utterance and the breath of God is by which we all live. But here in this passage, it's kind of left. Jesus is just saying, I don't want that. I want this. If I could have, sta- if, if all I wanted was bread, I could have stayed at home in Nazareth. I, I mean, there's plenty of bread there. If all I wanted was ordinary things that make up an ordinary life, I could have just stayed in the comfort, comfort of my own home. You know, I could have had my mom make me sandwiches. I, but I didn't do that. I have been led by the Holy Spirit out here into the desert for a reason. And that is... There is something else that makes me live. There's something bigger that brings life. Life is not just your stomach. It's not just having your physical needs met. So we have to remember that all of this was started with Jesus' relationship with the Holy Spirit. It says when he was being baptized, when all the people were being baptized, when Jesus also been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son with whom with you I am very pleased. Now, it, this, this is what the moment is. It's not just Jesus' baptism, because I think of all people, Jesus did not need to get baptized. Did you know that? Like even John the Baptist kind of goes, oh, hang on a second, you're supposed to do me, not me, you. Like, come on. That's, and Jesus says, no, we're doing everything the right way, all righteousness. And that's probably why Jesus is dedicated in the temple. Jesus gets baptized. It's not, just, it's not just for himself. It's for all of us. Because this next bit is what I have real problems with. How are Jesus and the Holy Spirit separated? Because as far as... Does anybody know Christianity a little bit? We've got this whole Trinity thing going on. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All co-equal, co-eternal, having an eternal relationship. Father is eternal. Son is the one through whom all things are made, but he comes into his creation, and then where's the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus here. So whatever was before that was Jesus without the Holy Spirit. But it's meant to be an example of your life and mine, right? Our life without the Spirit of God is not the normal human life. It is, a, it is wrong to li- live without the Spirit of God. That is to be inhuman, And it's where all of inhumanity comes from, is when our lives are guided by fleshly instincts, feelings, and ideas, rather than guided by the Spirit of God that wants to guide us in our fully autonomous but godly life. So the Holy Spirit fills Jesus, and it's the Holy Spirit, Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit, he returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert. So the So the Holy Spirit is who leads Jesus into the desert. Now, why is he being led there? Well, it's in answer to this question. Jesus answered him, it's written, man does not live by bread alone. Now, I've underlined that word live because that's what we're going to be talking about. Living. Living by the Spirit. What does it mean to live? What does it mean to have life? Uh, That's the question. How do we live? How do we get life? Jesus said, man doesn't live by, and you might think, well, if you don't eat, you'll die. So the truth is, man does live by bread. But that's not all that he means about life then, is it? Because if he could have had that human life, then that would have been enough. But he's like, no, there's more to living than just being alive in your flesh. And so a lot of people think about it in this sort of hierarchy. This is taken from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But these are the things that we work to get so that we can live. Do you know what I'm saying? It's we we work, we spend our life and our time so that we can get the things that keep us alive. Anybody feel like you're caught in a loop, right? You live to work to get the things to live, which keeps you able to work to get things to live. And so here's the sort of the beginning. You, if you don't have food, shelter, and clothing, you're going to end your life early. And in fact, those kinds of things, food especially, if you don't get a regular amount of that, you'll die. 
But then it goes on from that, safety and security. We need a sense of being, of, of presence, of, of being at least in a place where we're secure enough that we can go to sleep. Because if you never sleep because you're constantly all alert, then you'll die. Right? Or you'll go crazy and someone else will kill you. But at the, your life is going to end. So in order to be okay, we need to be free from anxiety and we need to have our basic needs met. But then it goes on from that, family and friends. Yes, you can eat. Yes, you can have your clothing, your shelter. You've got a nice car and a nice house. That's all fine. But if you don't have friends and family, there's something about your humanity that leaves you feeling empty. You, you feel like it's, it's not okay. You put any hardened criminal in an exclusive place where nobody else is around them, and it breaks them. Solitary confinement is not what we can endure. In fact, um, one of our members at the Elizabeth Church, he works in doing funerals, and his company uh, that he works for, they, they have the whatever government agreement there is to go and pick up the deceased people in their homes. So they pick them up, not just for his funeral home, but for others. And so they're the first people often to enter a home. And I was saying to him a couple, couple months ago, you know, um, how's business? Which, you know, <laughs> that's great. People are dying to get into our funeral home. Like this. <laughs> so, like... And he's saying, oh, it's the busy season. And I'm like, why? And he's like, because every time coming up to Christmas, people who are alone suddenly realize they're alone. And so many people lose their will to live. So kind of in the end, end their lives early because they just give up or take their lives. And so there is this massive amount of people that he goes to houses where people are deceased in their own houses and have been there for a while and there's nobody who knows or cares. You see, that's the thing. Without those connections, we somehow feel like we're not alive. We don't feel like we're okay. But then it goes beyond that. We need experiences. We, we, need, we need love. It's not just enough to have a friend. It's not enough to have a family member. We need something that means something to us. Something that gets us excited. Birthdays and celebrations and experiences and doing things and, and traveling and, and having ideas and, and experimenting with things that we do with our hands or things that we make or things that we build or, or there's some kind of challenge in life. We need those kinds of things. And then they lead on to the significance and meaning. Like if we don't have, have you ever had that moment where you just kind of feel like, what's it all about? What's it all about, dude? Are we just like all this cosmic waste of space, dude? <laughs> like, you know, the, the, have the, sorry, a little slip there. So they, I, I, I read about this a, a thing that happened in World War II where the German, uh, the, so Allied soldiers that were in a German prisoner of war camp we're all busy every day working in factories to make munitions, ammunition, armaments for the German military machine, who essentially killing their friends. So a horrible job. But even that didn't break the people. They still kind of made it through every day and kind of had sanity. So the Germans decided to do a trick where they just, they, they got rid of the factories and they just dumped a pile of sand in one corner of the compound and had the, the prisoners of war just take wheelbarrow loads of sand from one end of the compound to the other, dump it there, and then the next day they just took it all the way back. And they just began to do this day after day after day. And these people, prisoners of wars, who had been oppressed and struggling and beaten and were having a horrible time all that time, suddenly when they were given a task that was pointless, they couldn't live with it, they began to run for the electric fences and were machine gunned down. Because there's just something about us that just kind of goes, that's not life. It's not life. I mean, I have food. I have safety. I have, I have friends. I have experiences. But I need something more than that. I'm looking for life. You know, that uh, songs through the ages, I think, express this well. They have the frustration of this song. Sing it with me. You load 16 tons. And what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. Say, Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Sorry, I started a bit high there. Should have gone lower. <laughs> but uh, they, no, don't clap. That was terrible. So. Uh, <laughs> But isn't this, I mean, why that this, I mean, it became like a, a, a Negro spiritual song. It became the song of the working man in the field. Like, what's the point? You just get up every day, do labor so that you have enough food to go to bed to get up the next day. It's, it just feels pointless. There'd be a lot of people who feel like that is what their life is about. 
And then some people reach beyond the day-to-day, and like you too, they, they talk about having experiences, but those things aren't even enough. He says, I've kissed honeyed lips, felt the healing in her fingertips. It burned like fire, this burning desire. I don't know who his girlfriend is, but that is not okay. Like, I don't know. <laughs> what. One moment, there's honey, then she's on fire. I don't like, just, it's not okay. I think, I don't know. Was she a pyromaniac? I don't know. Um, I spoke with the tongue of angels. I've held the hand of a devil. Maybe that was the lady from early. Um, <laughs> It was warm in the night, could be fire. I, don't, um, I was cold as a stone. Like, but then he says, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I mean, a part of the reason why U2 songs became so popular is because they express this sort of inner, why? What are we here for? I, I'm looking for something. And when they sang the line, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, it's, it's actually an expression of all of our desires to say, come on, what is there? I climbed Mount, Entris, Mount Everest, now what? What else is there? And then if you're really feeling like you're having a good time and you're not given to this existential bend to why am I here, just listen to a bit of Bob Dylan. You know, how does it feel to be on your own with no direction home, like a complete unknown, like a rolling stone? Which, incidentally, is the song that they play while you're on hold for the suicide hotline. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> you're all like, what? Really? <laughs> Sorry. That how he just, I mean, he just wants to kind of point it out. If anybody's out there and you stop worrying about what life's about, let me just prod you and poke you. How does it feel to be on your own? You know, I have no idea where home is. You're just a complete unknown, like a Rolling Stone, and not like a band member of the Rolling Stones, who are like those people who look like they're alive but are actually dead. Now, um, this is the oldest song. Now, I don't, by song, I mean, I, I was like researching, I'm thinking, man, there's a lot of old songs that are about this thing. Is it, what's the oldest song about? So I Googled it. And the oldest song that we have where we have both music and lyrics is found on the Asaikilos epitaph uh, in a place in Turkey. And it's actually a, something that was put at a grave, uh, so it's probably a well-known tune to them. And it has the music and the lyrics, and this is how it goes. Sing with me. What? No, sorry, I don't know that song. While you live, shine. Have no grief at all. Life exists only for a short while, and time demands its toll. Isn't that not the same thing? It's the same search. It's the same why. What are we doing here? And if you want to go older where we don't have this wor- the song, but we have the lyrics, Ecclesiastes, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? I mean, that, if you were going to market a book, don't put that on the cover. <laughs> you, oh, don't read this, you'll be, okay, why? He's just saying, it's all, this is the smartest guy who had all of the shelter, all of the food, all of the clothing, all the experiences, all the relationships, he had everything, and he's like, what's the point? I can't live. What is life about? So one time, Jesus is having this discussion. He's having a discussion with a certain group of people. Here's the group of people. They are Jewish people, but they've had an encounter with Jesus that they were fed. There was 5,000 men and probably a total party of over 10,000 people. And Jesus fed all of them with five loaves and two fish. It's one of those amazing miracles. He does that twice. The second time was with 4,000 people, but he did it with less, more stuff, fed less people is still a lot, though. It was always a miracle. So those group of people, then, they just figured out, hey, Jesus is just like this food machine. He's like your parents' fridge at home. You go there, you get food out of it. You don't know who put it there. You just, he can get you whatever you want. You want a bit of salami? It's a salami. He just, so they, they follow Jesus around. He, Jesus tries to get away from them. They follow him around the Sea of Galilee, and they show up at his next place, and Jesus is like, guys, I know why you're here. You're here for a free lunch. But there's more to life than lunch. There's more to life than food. And so he tells them in this part, he says, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Now, there's two things wrong with being said. Everybody focuses, don't work for the food that perishes. You're like, "Eh, what's the food that doesn't perish? That's what I'm saying. No, 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 no. He changes both things. He talks about not working, and he talks about food that doesn't perish. 
See, both of those things are in there because he says the Son of Man has to give you this food. You can't work for this food. Whatever is the food that Jesus was out there in that desert looking for is a food that only God can give you you can't work for. And it's the kind of food that doesn't leave you starving. It doesn't leave you hungry. It doesn't go away. It stays in you, for you, through you, living. And so the question is, what food doesn't spoil? Why do I need Jesus to give it to me? And what will Jesus give me? So let me just start at the beginning. What, um, why do I need the, the Jesus to give it to me? Here's the most common thought. I must earn my spiritual food. So whether you follow any kind of these formulas, legalism, you stick to a bunch of rules, or maybe it's a religion where you have to go a certain place on a certain day or dress in a certain way or eat a certain kind of food or say a certain kind of prayer, or if it's a karma, and karma is just, I mean, that's, you know, Buddhist and Hindu, but that karma is, is the same payback scheme that all the rest of religions have, which is that if you do something, you'll get a spiritual reward for it. It's just karma kind of holds off the payments till the following life or live as a, right? So you're always going to get it. There's no use by date on karma, right? It's like you did it this century, you're going to get it four centuries from now in your butt, and that's, you're just going to be so upset because it's going gonna, it's gonna to sting. So the, karma is the same sense of you, whatever you're getting, you earned it. The rules, there's people that follow a certain set of code for life, you know, like, you know, don't c cross a double solid, you know, make sure you indicate before you turn. There's a bunch of rules about living that you got to follow. And then there's, then there's this, uh, moralism, I think, is the best way to describe Australians when it comes to religion. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Australians are, are, are a sub, you know, like a different species. I was going to say subspecies, but they're not sub, they're not sub anything, they're they are a subset of many species, uh, uh, different from Canadians. But, <laughs> but, but Australians seem to have this idea that there's a moral code that if you live by it, that you will get good things in your life. And sort of the results of anybody's life, if you looked at them and they're in a good place, it's because they did the moral code thing and they got that. Or if it's going bad, they didn't do whatever the moral code was. But the problem with the moral code is nobody knows what it is, right? So it's different for everybody, you know, because, you know, thieves have a code. I don't steal from my friends. You, you steal from everyone else. It's just not your friends because that would make me a terrible thief. Okay, well, all right. So, but there's just like different standards and everybody has this, their own sense of moralism by which they kind of have a sense of I'm getting what I deserve by what I do. Now, there is one in the first of the covenants in the Bible. The first covenant given to Moses goes kind of like, this is a great summary verse for that. He says, you shall follow my rules and keep my statutes. That's not statues, by the way. Statutes and walk in them. They're like regulations. He says, I'm the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. Why? Because if he does them, if a person does them, he shall live by them, I am the Lord. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, here, here's, the th here's the thing about the commands. In the Old Testament, when the commands are given, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, there is a proclamation, and basically they stood on two sides of a valley and they shouted curses and blessings. And they basically said, if you keep all the commands, then God will bless your house, your field, your livestock, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Everybody will be afraid of you and you will conquer everybody. Your land will be fantastic if you keep my rules. Now, the thing about the rules is, the rules are not natural consequences to the rules. Meaning this, if I, if I don't steal, the natural consequence for not stealing is I might keep my friends because not stealing from my friends keeps my friends around or I don't get something stolen from me. But that's not a spiritual rule. See, a spiritual rule says that if you don't steal, then God will bless you. It has nothing to do with something in the mere immediate context, like not coveting. It doesn't mean you just walk around with nothing. It means that God blesses you with something. There is, a, there is a blessing put upon you by God that's not related necessarily to the rule that you kept. It's a blessing. You know, like, here's the one. Honor your mother and father. Now, that's a command with a blessing because those who honor their mother and fathers will live long in the land. And that doesn't mean just because your parents won't kill you. It, it, 
it, there is a blessing on your life if you honored your parents. You say, well, my parents are this, but God's that. Well, God is the one that brings it about. So he, that's why he says, if you keep the rules, you will get life by the rules. So in the book of Ezekiel, after a very long time of the people of Israel not keeping the commands, it says, so I led them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and made known to them my rules, by which if a person does them, he shall live. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Now, hang on a second. You're probably thinking right now, what has the Sabbath got to do with a sanctification? And why is it put in here right after the rule keeping but didn't get kept? Here's the reason. A sanctifying Sabbath, the word, the word Sabbath in Hebrew just means to cease. To, it's like stop. You do six and then you stop. Now, if you work six days, you get the income from the six days. But if on the seventh day you don't work, where's your income going to come from? From the last six days? No, no, that's not what the Bible says. The income comes from God, right? So God says, you do six times work, income, work, income, work, income, six times, and then the seventh one, no work, but you still got income. Hey, how did that work out? And he says, that's why that's in there, is because you need to recognize that I'm the one who will bless you. I'm the one, because the Lord who sanctifies, who needs sanctifying? Holy people or unholy people? Unholy people need sanctifying, right? So... God then is blessing people who don't deserve it. And this is where we understand that the commands are actually a revelation of our need for Jesus. They're actually not commands that we can keep. They're commands that help us to understand that we need to stop and see that God is the one who loves us all along. And it's our rebellion against him or our anxiety that we don't trust him that keeps us from living closely connected to him and being blessed by him. So, if we don't earn, well, then how do we get it? Here's very basic New Testament theology. Romans chapter 4, he compares how Abraham got blessed. He says this, for what does the scripture say? Abraham, he is like the super class top champion of the Israelite nation. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. See, there's the sanctifying part. His faith is counted as righteousness. So there actually is another way to be blessed. You can do things to receive something or you can believe God. And it can be given to you. Not as what you earned, but given to you as a gift. Now, this is where really, really important. You might, have, you might have a version of God in your mind or in your heart where you think you need to work certain things, do certain things in order for God to bless you. But that is simply biblically wrong. What we have from God always comes as a gift. It's always been a gift. That's, there actually isn't a difference because nobody could earn anything from God. So we've always been dependent on the gift-giving nature of God. And he wants to bless our lives. So the wages, that is what we could earn ourselves, of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now there's sort of the example. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are given the free gift of life. But if you work, do you know what you get? Death. If you labor for your food, you die to get life. You give up your life, you die so that you can live. But Jesus wants to give us life. Now, this is the most overlooked thing. Um, I actually feel like I need to preach this a lot simply because it's just so against our human nature. But the most overlooked problem of, for the religious-minded person is this. You have to complete the whole job list or you get the curse. If you it, hear how it goes, Galatians chapter three, verse 10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide 
by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, here's one of the things missing in people's thinking about, about uh, you know, the Ten Commandments and all the commands of God. They kind of pick them up and do a few that they're okay at and then ignore the other 600 that they can't do. Because there's some commands that seriously are very hard to obey. Have you ever tried not coveting? Right? I mean, right now, you're coveting my good looks and my, uh, you know, my dress sense. Or, you know, I, I, no, no, sorry. Probably not. Coveting my sense of humor. And so, like, it's, it's some, some are quite, you know, I haven't killed anybody this week. You know, but just this week. But, there, but Jesus said you're not supposed to even be angry. Well, that's impossible. How are you supposed to ever get not upset at people? That's just ridiculous. So, so what, what people ignore in the whole, keep, let me, I'll tell you like this. Uh, um, recently, let's just say vaguely like that, I was in another country and, and I was preaching in the church on the Sunday. And because I was there on the Saturday, they also had a Sabbath service in the church. So I thought, I'll go along to the Sabbath service. I didn't have to, but they say, you come if you want, come to the Sabbath service. Now, what does that mean is they, they think that you, in order to be a proper Christian and be blessed, that you have to worship on the actual Sabbath day, which is the Saturday, okay? So I went to this service and sat there as a guest, and for an hour and a half, the preacher preaches to us about keeping the Sabbath. I'm thinking, we're already here, for goodness sake. Like, th this is the wrong crowd. <laughs> um, but for an hour and a half, it's keep the Sabbath this, don't break the Sabbath that, you better get here on the Sabbath, and those people who don't do the Sabbath, they're going to be cursed, and it's not going to work out for them because God said, honor my Sabbath, 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 an hour and a half. I'm like, yes, I get your point. But I wasn't like that. I was very polite. I don't know, very nice. <laughs> so... Um, then the next day, and I got a preach, and I preached grace through faith. The whole message was how God loves to bless bad people who believe in him. The whole message was just about, hey, listen to this story about this bad guy in the Bible. Boom, healed. Did he deserve it? No. Did he keep the Sabbath? No. And he was blessed. And so I just preached the whole <laughs> sermon like that. And altar call at the end, 50 people came up. We had, you know, people being healed, deaf people here, and we had people's lives being changed. It was all blessings because God was honoring his word and giving out free gifts to the unworthy, right? That's what gifts are, right? So he's just doing all this stuff. Afterwards, people come up and they're like, but what about the Sabbath? I took him to this verse and said, you see, the thing, that's nothing wrong with keeping a Sabbath. But if you're going to try to get your, let's listen to what it says. It's evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous will live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. If you are trying to get your spiritual life by the works that you do, you're under a curse because you can't do all the works. And if you miss, the law is like this, 100% or you score zero. It's not, like, it's not graded on a curve. There is, it's either you are holy or you are not holy. You lived exactly like God lived or you failed. And if you fail, you're under a curse. But Jesus has a solution for the curse. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. Now, Jesus had to be crucified so that he could experience the only kind of death that has a curse built into it. Why? Because the life of Jesus is uncursable. He is the one who kept every command, who lived exactly according to the nature of God and never failed in any way. He is the one. And so he takes and say, here, if you are trying to work for what you deserve, look out because you're going to get what you deserve. But you see, Jesus didn't get what he deserved. Jesus was crucified. He didn't deserve to be crucified. He deserved eternal life with God forever. But he took what he didn't deserve, so that we could get what we don't deserve. Now, so that Christ, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, that, that faith blessing, that Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that's us who are not of, Gen of Jewish birth, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Now, here we are at the back, back at the beginning. See, Jesus was receiving life through the spirit. And Jesus is giving life through through the Spirit. Here, here's a summary, summary verse. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. 
Now, when I say if we live by the Spirit, that, that doesn't necessarily just mean your born-again experience. It means where you get your spiritual life from. You get your spiritual life from the Holy Spirit. And since you get life constantly from the Spirit, a blessing on your life constantly because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, and a blessing flowing out through you to other people because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, you become somebody that flows in this life. Now, the goal of discipleship then is, let's just keep in step with the Spirit. Please, can you just? And I've been a Christian now for 32 years, and that is not so easy. It is not so easy to keep in step with the Spirit because I am constantly, and you're probably the same, I'm constantly going back to trying to work for things, to by the flesh earn things from God or from life so that I'll be feeling more fulfilled. Like I, I want more of this and more of that and more of those and this and some of this and more of this kind of food and that kind of food. And I work and work and work and I'm just more and more in a curse. And see, that's what Galatians chapter 5 is actually all about. The, the works of the flesh produce bad things. They don't produce good things. But living in the Spirit, by the Spirit, through the Spirit, living in accordance with what the Holy Spirit is saying to you about who you are in Christ, leaves you living a life of, of love, Joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. There's nothing that will stop that or change it so that you get death in it. You'll always be abounding in life. We don't, we don't try to be good. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. And we live out that spiritual life. If you, are, if you have Christ in your heart, you are alive by the Spirit in Christ. And you are living by the Spirit in Christ. And now Paul just says to you, can you please just stay in step with what he's saying? If you start doing it, you're only, oh, come on. Now you're, no, just stay in step. Now that word for sleep in step is the Greek word parapatio. You probably know the word patio as in the sense I've walked out on my patio. Patio just means to step. Okay, I walked out on my steps. Um, parapatio means to stay in step, you know, to walk exactly in lockstep with the Holy Spirit as he leads us through life where he just keeps saying, no, no, I know you really want to hate that person. Try loving them. No, but, uh, but, oh, yeah, but, hey, nah, no, just love them. Yeah, but what about, no, it's, it's just going to love them. It'll turn out way better. Yeah, but he ripped me off. Don't worry, I got plenty of blessings for you. Yeah, but I got to punish. No, let me punish. You just stay with me. You see, that's the thing is we, all our human solutions for life and fulfillment are empty. But the life of the Spirit just keeps pouring out more of the goodness of God in us. And that life that Jesus was seeking for, well, here, Galatians, Romans says like this. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What is, what is the love message from God to you? What is the Holy Spirit trying to pour in? You just need to receive by faith. You don't need to work for it. Just receive it. And so this year, we're going to be talking about life in the Spirit. Kind of how, how do we do that? We talk about why, why we need to do that, and who. The who is probably the most important part, because who is about identity. It's about who and knowing God is, knowing what he's like, and knowing who we are in Christ, and walking in that newness. Because when the Holy Spirit came on Jesus, the message was, this is my beloved son. It's the Spirit creates relationships so that you are in connection with God, without fear, knowing that your life will always come from God to you. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Jesus went to the wilderness because he knew that he needed more than just food, clothing, shelter, friends, things to do, experiences. He needed a life that was eternal, that wasn't based on this world. 
and he was out there getting it. And the devil said, just go back. Just get food. Jesus said, I don't want that food anymore. I need something better. So, Father, we seek you out. We seek you out. Lord, we're not in a wilderness right now, but here we are in a moment of recognition, Lord, that we need what only you can give and that the, the earthly pleasures, the things of this world, they all seem to um, tantalize us. They, they seem like they're going to offer us something that's like life, but in the end, they leave us feeling empty. And Lord, we spend, we've spent our time, we've spent our lives seeking for things that didn't actually give us life. So right now, Father, we want a Sabbath stop with you. We're going to cease from our labors, and we're going to turn our hearts towards you. God, we need what we can't earn. We need what we can't, we don't even deserve. We need you to breathe on us. We need you to give us life. Lord, all of us today, we need your forgiveness, but we need grace so that we can receive something that's bigger and better than what this world can offer us. So, Father, we turn our whole hearts towards you, and we welcome your Holy Spirit in us. Holy Spirit, come. Come and fill our hearts. Give us faith. Give us love. Give us hope. Give us joy. Give us peace. Holy Spirit, give us contentment. Lord, come into our worlds, into our hearts, into all of our anxieties and all of our troubles and all of our worries. Come and be bigger than all of that. Give us spiritual food. The Son of Man has to give us the spiritual food. So Jesus, we just reach out to you for that right now. Do you have an empty place in your heart, in your life right now? You have places that you really feel a sense of being incomplete. There's just not enough. Stop looking to the things of this world and reach out to Jesus right now. Why don't you see his hand extended towards you with the bread of life in it? And he's saying, here, take and eat. This is my body. You see, Jesus wants you to have that. So just in your heart of faith, take what Jesus is offering. Receive him. Say, Jesus, I want to take you into myself, and I want your life in me. I thank you that you took the curse on the tree for me. Thank you that you moved, removed all of the badness, and you left nothing but your goodness. So I welcome you into my life right now. And Holy Spirit, I welcome you into my, the deepest parts of my being. And I ask that you lead me like you led Jesus. Lead me to the good things. Lead me to real life. Lead me away from the traps. And lead me in paths of righteousness for your namesake. Father, we thank you that you're here present with us. And that you answer the faith cry of every heart with goodness, kindness, and love. So, Lord, we just receive from you right now, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Help us to learn to live, to walk in the Spirit, and stay in step with the Spirit. Lord, help us, guide us, yoke us together with Jesus, and help us to learn to walk as he did. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand to our feet? This is a great time to just express our love to God and just to focus once again on him as our source, as our as the one that will pour out the radiance of his grace on our lives so that we can mature and grow and be content in every way. Thank you, Lord. Captivate your heart, the searching heart is Jesus. How precious. Shattered heart. 